Hi, Peter Jones, author, property investor, ex-chartered surveyor, and I'm delighted to be joined by a very good friend of mine today, Dixie Walker. Now, Dixie is a very experienced property investor, been in property for many, many years, a very, very successful and experienced deal packager stroke property sourcer. How many deals have you done now, Dixie? Do we know? Uh, I don't know. But it's into the hundreds. We're getting on for a thousand deals that you've packaged. Yeah. A property developer, a bit of a whiz when it comes to marketing, an expert on marketing, and an all-round businessman, I think, is probably leaving out many, many of your many talents there. But just to give us a who you are. Sorry? And I teach skiing. And you teach skiing, absolutely, yeah. Which is uh, uh, maybe a topic for another day. But there we go. So anyway, I thought it'd be great to talk to Dixie today because Dixie, like myself, you were property investing in 2008. Yeah. So do you want to just give us a little bit of a background of what you were doing then and um, how, how you got into property and where, where you'd actually got to by 2007, 2008? Well, uh, I, st be I started in property full time, if you can call it that in 2004 um before that i had a, a kind of traditional business which um which was closed by a uh, a piece of uh, european legislation which changed and it rather cut our legs off um but from 99 to 2003 we bought uh probably four or five brr properties and, um, but I was so busy working in the business, I didn't really have time to do very much more. So we were closed down by trading standards um, because of a change in the, the European Medical Devices Directive law. Mostly the translation, but we don't need to as well. So, um, and I had about uh, 20, uh, yeah, around 30 staff at the time. So I had to make them all redundant. And uh, of course, our income was uh, stopped virtually overnight. Uh, so I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll go to the pub. And I stayed there for about three months. And then Rose came and got me and said, it's time to go back to work. Our income had stopped, but we still had some money. And one of the reasons being that we owned the building that our office was in. So I decided that it would be a good idea to get some more of these BRR properties because there's no money left in, and um, and they're getting three hundred pounds a month ish net. So I rang the guy who had found my four or five, and I said to him, "What um, uh, if I want some more of those houses? How many could I get?" And he said, "I can probably get you about one every six weeks." And I said, "Well, if you find them, I buy them, you renovate them, refurbish them, and I sell them when we split the profit." Then how many could you get now? He said about two a week. And in about 18, in the first 18 months, we did something like 89, I think. So that was the beginning of it. Mm. And we, we'd started without any clients. So I rushed around uh, doing the same kind of thing as people do now on Facebook, but this was 2004, so Facebook didn't really exist except in the bedroom of Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and, but I was writing for some online magazines, sort of agony uncle, um, put my name around and generally told everybody what I did. And the rest is that it just kind of snowballed. And uh, I started in the Northeast, hence the name of the company, uh, and then kind of moved down the East, East Coast, down as far as about Lincolnshire and and then 2008 hit. So 2008, you're full time in property. You're packaging deals for clients. You're also buying presumably deals for yourself. Mm. And then of course it all happened. And I don't know what you can remember about it. To me, I can remember it very vividly. Was it September the 15th or something that Lehman Brothers went down? And I just yeah. knew at that point it was just never going to be the same again. And it hasn't been. Yeah. I had, to, I, I had a little bit of a heads up on it because a friend of mine was a fund manager at the time and he rang me from Cornwall, uh, I think on the, on, before the American markets opened. And he said, 
go to the bank and take out every single penny that you can get because cash will be king. And of course, I ignored him. And uh, but as it turns out, it, it, it didn't go quite as badly as he thought it was going to. So the fact that we didn't take a load of cash out wasn't a massive, massive deal. But what happened was that uh, mortgage application or mortgage offers were being withdrawn. That was the, one of the biggest thing. Um, not too dissimilar to what it is now in a way, but for different reasons. First time I'd ever come across a mortgage offer being withdrawn. Uh, I mean, it used to be that if you got a mortgage offer, you, you, it's, it's, like, it's like cash. It's like a banker's draft. Mm. You know, it's never withdrawn. Suddenly they were. For I, us, I'm though... Not- I, 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 I was just to interrupt you, Dick. I mean, one of the things which I heard at the time was they weren't just being withdrawn, but they were being withdrawn on the day of completion. Yeah. So some poor souls had actually exchanged, waiting, thinking they're going to complete, and suddenly the bank said, well, we're not lending, but they've still got to complete. And yeah. there was all sorts of people being sued by developers and others for yeah. money they didn't have, being bankrupted. It was all very messy. Yeah, it was. And, and people who were doing what we were doing, um, we were... We were quite, I hesitate, I hesitate to use the word lucky, but we were quite lucky really because we weren't in that difficult a position at the time. Uh, most of the, we, we, we did sell quite a lot of new build properties at the time from 2004, 5, 6. Uh, this was before Help to Buy came out and, and we were getting genuine discounts of 30 percent sometimes. But we dealt with small developers, so nobody, nothing bigger than about 20 properties usually sort of eight to 12-ish. And those guys were the first ones to, to fall over because if, if, when, you, when you're developing, there comes a time when that's the very, time, that's the very moment when you don't want anything to go wrong mm. because you're overexposed, you've used all of your cash to, because things have gone wrong, so you've had to throw some money at it. And then the bank withdraws a, a mortgage product or refinancing or whatever and it cuts your legs off well that happened to a number of developers that we knew so so for the 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 major thing that happened to me when Lehman Brothers fell over was that all of my clients who had paid a reservation deposit deposit via our lawyers to the developer immediately wanted their money back well of course the developers weren't giving the money back Mm. So I think we had about £80,000, which our clients wanted back. So what we did was we we used to take uh, £2,000 deposit. That went to the lawyer. The lawyer held £1,000 and then sent £1,000 off to the seller's um, lawyer. So the seller's lawyer had half of the £80,000 and we, our lawyer, had the other half. But virtually all of that 40,000 that was with the developers just disappeared. So now I've got clients saying, hang on a minute, you took my money. And so what we did was um, we, we negotiated with them and some we paid back and some we uh, paid the cash back and some we said, well, we'll replace it with you when everything settles down. And some people were happy with that and so on. And, but that was... We, I know you spent quite a long time with your head under a duvet, um, but that was about the time I was thinking I might go and put my head under a duvet. Yeah, well, you were down the pub. I just happened to stay in bed. Oh, no, I was back from the pub by then. Okay. I was, I was only down the pub for about three months. Yeah. So 2008 was a difficult time for a lot of people, you and yeah. me included. So today... We, it, it's it's different and it's the same and I think there's lessons that we can all learn from 2008 which we can probably translate into 2020 not maybe identical but there's general principles maybe or maybe even very specific things I don't know you've had time probably to reflect over the last week or two about what's happening out in the world at the moment what did you learn in 2008 that you think could be helpful today first thing is don't panic Mm. because everybody's in the same boat. I'm laughing um, because I've, I've literally just this morning recorded my next video, which is basically don't panic. So I totally agree. 
Oh, well. Don't, don't panic, Mr. Mallory. Don't tell me your name, Pike. So uh, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing I would say is don't hide your head under a duvet. Mm. Uh, it, it's just another problem. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a serious problem, but it's just another problem. And there will be lots of people out there who do put their head under a duvet for the next two, three, four months. Um, and they won't come out of it as well as people that take action now. Mm. Uh, we're, we're in a situation where we've had uh, several, we've, we've got several um, properties that are in the process of being sold. Well, eight actually. And they've all come to a grinding halt. Mm. And of course, when Boris says, um, I would encourage everybody not to move in the next, in the foreseeable future. That completely puts the kibosh on. Mm. Mm. On the other hand, when your bank says to you now, this didn't happen in 2008, but when your bank says to you now, look, you can't have any more money or you can't renew that development loan or you can't, we can't give you the mortgage that we promised we were going to. It's not so much of a, a, of a disaster as it would have been, say, six months ago, because, six, because now we've got emergency powers in place. So you're not going to be sued and you're not going to be bankrupted just because you can't pay a bill. Mm, mm. But that's the first thing to remember. Yeah. If you don't pay a bill, if you don't pay your mortgage, uh, however many mortgages you've got, if you don't pay your mortgage, you'll get a, bad, uh, a black mark on It's not a black mark. You'll, you'll, get, uh, you'll get that registered on your credit file. That's not so good. But given that nobody's given any credit at the moment, it doesn't really matter, does it? Mm. So it's, in, a, in a way, it's not as bad as 2008 was because we are all in the, in the same boat. Mm. I'll tell you what happened to us in 2008. And specifically, apart from the things with, with my clients, as far as the bank is concerned, we had a hunting fund with RBS and RBS were very, very naughty at the time because they were, they were calling loans in left, right and center and basically finished up a load of properties that they stolen. Um, and they, they sort of tried the same with us. So with our hunting fund, we were able to buy properties at 70% of value. Plus we could borrow 70% of refer costs uh, and then refinance in due course. Well, as it happens, we didn't refinance all of them uh, because they, uh, the, our relationship manager said, no, don't worry about too much about that. I think we had um, three, three and a quarter million pounds worth of um, facility. And it was about, at about, I can't remember exactly, maybe half. So they demanded repayment of all the mortgages. Now I could understand that they would say, because it's a commercial loan, and you could you could have seventy percent loan to value, but you it was based on current value. So if values went down, then you had to pay some money back mm. every time they review it. So they reviewed it, and instead of saying no, we need ten percent or fifteen percent or whatever of cash back, they said we want all of the money back. So I said no, and they were a bit surprised because nobody ever does that. And I was moved from Glasgow to Manchester and Manchester rang me and said, we want all your money back. And I said, no. So they moved me to Birmingham and they said the same thing. And I said, no. And then they moved me to Colchester, which is not too far from where I live. And then they invited me in for a conversation and the conversation went downhill because really. <laughs> I, I was actually then sitting face to face with a guy. And he said, well, if we say we need the money back, then you've got to pay the money back. I said, no, I haven't. Because you know as well as I do, that in six or nine months' time, these, these valuations will be back again. So if you, put a, if you demand the money back now, you will, put us, you will make us bankrupt. And then you'll get no money at all. So why don't we do it sensible way? 
Now, and that's a really useful lesson, I think, because there's going to be people today who are probably thinking, oh, my word, what happens if the worst happens and the world falls in and the banks start knocking on my door? The reality yeah. is, as you say, we're all in this together, so I don't think that's going to happen anyway. But even if it no. did, sometimes common sense has to prevail. And the last thing the banks want is a load of properties they can't sell. It reminds me of that old expression which says something like, if you owe the bank 100 quid, you've got a problem. If you owe the bank a million quid, the bank's got the problem. Yeah. And I think sometimes we don't realize just how much strength that sounds a bit manipulative. And I'm not suggesting that we do try and, you know, take advantage of the banks. But sometimes, you know, we can say no and we should say no. And I think you're, you're a great example of that. Yeah. I mean, everybody was a bit surprised, frankly. And, um, and when I actually went to see this guy, he said, well, it doesn't work like that. I said, well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid it does. Mm. You know, he, he said, well, you've got personal guarantees. And I said, I know, but only up to this much. Mm. I haven't got personal guarantees on three and a quarter million quid. Mm. So, you know, it's the company that you lend the money to. And it might cost, I, I forget what the number was, something like £200,000. Um, so we have personal guarantees of up to £200,000 or thereabouts. And I said, but, you know, if you, if you go the way that you're, you're suggesting, you're going to lose a fortune. Mm. And I said, I, I don't care. I'll just walk away. Mm. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, watch me. And mm. I actually stood up and walked out of his office. Mm. And what happened then? Uh, mm. Good question. What do you think happened then? They came running after you and said, he not literally, so hasty. He literally called me back. Let's have a cup of tea and a biscuit and talk about it. Exactly. Exactly. And then over time, about 18 months, I think, we gradually managed to, I mean, for the first six or nine months, there were no mortgages, you will recall. We actually had some really good deals then because these, these smaller developers that we'd been dealing with before, they were, a lot of them were caught with their pants down. So they just wanted to get as much money back as they could. So we were literally buying them at cost. And they, in fact, they were offering them to us at cost. And they said, look, this, this one, that cost me 60 grand or 80 grand or whatever it was. Just get me a pound back on top of that or as close as you can get. So I'd sell those to clients um, who were cash buyers. And just like it is now, people, are, uh, the bank rate is at 0.1%. How much money do you think you're going to be getting on your cash that's in a bank now? Mm. It's not, nothing. If, even at what it was before, even at 2.75 or 1.75. What was it? One, one seven. Anyway, wherever where, where it was before, you're still losing money by having cash in the bank because inflation mm. erodes the value. Mm. Um, and at, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, people were looking for safe havens and it didn't mm. look like the stock market was a safe haven anymore. Mm. So we sold shed loads of houses mm. once, the, once the first, you know, once the dust settled, as it were. So I think mm. it, took, it probably took us probably 18 months to, to, to work our way through the, the portfolio and sell off without losing too much, without losing money, sell off some, refinance others and so on. And, here's a, and I, I used to speak to this guy on a regular basis. And then it, <laughs> the last thing was I went down to see him and the idea was that we were going to sign the papers and we owed him we owed the bank just under six grand. And we'd had lots of telephone conversations. So I went to see him. And he said, right, Dixie, there we are. I said, so to, today we closed it. I said, uh, yeah, kind of. He said, what do you mean, kind of? I said, well, we owe you six grand. He said, yeah, I know. All you have to do is pay the six grand. We're done. I said, we haven't got six grand. He said, well, what are we going to do? I said, can you lend it me? Can you lend me six grand? Give me a six grand overdraft and I'll give you six grand. <laughs> and do you know what he said? Yeah. He said, no. <laughs> no, 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 he didn't. He said, I can't do that. I said, what can you do then? He said, well, I can't authorize six grand. I said, what can you authorize? He said, I can authorize five. I said, right, do that. Mm. And that's what we did. Mm. So we paid that off on a silly low interest over a period of two years yeah key thing is you came through it yeah came through Got it. Stay on the log, haven't you? yeah absolutely so thinking about today and thinking back yeah. to 2008 i mean we're, I, I know we don't know we, you haven't got a crystal ball any more than i have but 
what's your feelings about where we're going with this? What's, what's going to happen to property? What, how are things going to look in six months, in 12 months? And what are you going to be doing to protect yourself? And what would you be advising people to be doing? Maybe to A, to protect themselves, and B, I don't want to use the word opportunity, because if you've seen my videos, you'll know I think it's a bit early for that. There's bad things happening and we're not through it yet. But when the time comes, what will we be doing in property to make the most of it? Well, given that we don't know how long the effects of COVID-19 are going to stick around, lockdown, etc. So it's quite difficult at the moment to, to, to go and view properties and, and so on. But I, I disagree with you slightly in the sense that now could be an excellent time to help people out of their problem. Um, and I think whoever's, whoever's stuck with the house, I mean, for example, that there are, I was speaking to our lawyer last week, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier on that if you've if you've exchanged and not completed, and then your mortgage offer is pulled, then it costs you a lot of money. Well, that rule mm. has changed. The law mm. society have told them not to apply that that rule will, will not apply under the current circumstances. So there will be lots of people out there who thought they were going to move, and maybe they're going to move set off because they want the cash in the house or downsize or whatever. So there will be people there there are people out there who need our help and, and are prepared to, to take less than normal market value for their houses. Mm. And maybe we could take them on a lease option or a, or a rent to rent basis, that sort of thing. So there are opportunities out there this, this very day mm. to do that sort of thing. If, However, you can, if, you mm. if, if you can find them. Yeah. Well, I just think if, if, if physically you can get out, which at the time of recording this, in, we're not really meant to be going out unless we're going to buy essential stuff. But I get your point. The opportunity will open up as the lockdown begins to yeah. fade. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you don't necessarily need to uh, go to a house to view it. Do you? True. True. But yeah, that, that's completely true. But so going, let's say it's let's say by the end of the year everything is never going to be back to normal, is it? Because it will be back to the new normal. Let's no, say no. by the end of the year, uh, then it is back to the new normal. Then I think that prices are going to be pretty much where they are now because, uh, oddly enough, I posted this morning to answer uh, somebody on, on uh, Facebook and they were talking about micro and macro markets. Um, and obviously you need to know your gold mine area uh, uh, intimately well. But general, generally speaking, the house prices are based on the availability of mortgages. Mm. The, the more, completely. yeah, completely. And the, the, the more money that is available through mortgages, the higher the prices will become. So yes. at the moment, if you can buy or agree to buy properties at below retail. You know, I call it below retail value, not below market mm. value. Mm. Um, so if you can buy below retail value now, when the mortgages become available again, then there will be a, a, a bit of a spike in prices. At the moment, so what was the one before 2008, Peter? Was it 87 or something when house prices went through the floor? Yeah, 1998, wasn't it? it? They boomed in 87 because of the Lawson budget. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So it was around late 89, early 90. 89, 90, it all tanked because it all got too toppy and every, everything went a bit pear-shaped, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So a friend of mine said to me, how much is your house, how, mu how much value has your house lost? And I said, no, and he meant in, in, in pounds, not percentages, because they... they, they Dropped about 20%. And I said, well, nothing at all. He said, no, it has. It said so on the news. I said, I know, but I'm, I'm not selling it. So you don't lose the money until you crystallize the loss, do you? Mm, that's right. And, and vice versa. So, um, so to go back directly to your question, what, where do I think the market's going to be? I, I think that once, the, once things have settled, I think the market will go back to where we are now because like there is uh, uh, people who are lo in lockdown, there's a pent up energy, isn't there? there mm. And it's only like eight, nine days or so. And people are dying to get back to work. 
Mm. Ridiculous. But, you know, if this goes on for another couple of months, can you imagine? Mm. And people will be desperate to get back to work. Now, exactly the same thing is happening in the banking sector. People are not taking out mortgages this month, this week, this month, because the surveyors can't get out to, to do the valuations. So how long do you think the banks are going to stay like that? They will find a way, won't they? Because otherwise the banks will go to them. Mm. There will be well, interestingly, I'm, tr I'm trying to do a couple of refinances at the moment, believe it or not, and I kind of assumed it was never going to happen. But my mortgage broker and the solicitors are ploughing on trying to do them anyway. But do you know what the hold-up is at the moment? The banks can't process their paperwork because everybody has been allocated to dealing with three-month mortgage holidays, which yeah. means that the normal applications aren't happening. There's been so many people applying for mortgage holidays that the banks can't cope, and that's grown the system to a halt. Who would have thought? But you're right. At some point, they're going to come out through this, and they're going to think, crikey, we'd better do some business. Mm. I mean, banks have share prices, and their share prices are based on their profits and their turnover, and they're mm. going to have no turnover, apart from mm. the interest-free loans that are backed by the government. Yeah. You know, that, that's not going to add to their value, is it? Not no. that banks ever really make any money, but that's another thing. Mm. Yeah, so I think this is easy to say, but I think that, that don't go and hide, don't be too despondent. Take this opportunity to learn new skills or hone new skills. Spend some time looking at your gold mine areas. Um, make sure you're talking to upbeat people. Uh, networking is is uh, you know physical networking is, is difficult at the moment. But and as you know, I don't really like networking. <laughs> but uh, I, I, in the last week, I've been on. Um, three or four networking calls, which have been very good and uh, very upbeat and very useful. And I, I, I do Zoom calls like this with my mentees and it's, and they're, and they're all, all, well, all of my mentees, I can't speak for everybody on, the, on these calls, but there was one on, on the weekend. I think there were 25 people on the call. And by the end of it, everybody was upbeat because mm. we were having this kind of conversation and then there were mm. Q and A, there was Q and A at the end. So everybody yeah. was upbeat because they're surrounded by upbeat people. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing you all again. Brilliant. Well, until then, Dixie, stay safe, stay healthy. Yeah, you too, Peter. <laughs>